Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good morning to those of you who are joining us from New Zealand. Um, thank you for joining us this, today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Future of UVEB Advanced Manufacturing Trends, Strategies, and Applications, a regular webinar series presented by the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in collaboration with RADTEC International North America, the Association for UV and EB Technology. My name is Brandon Murphy, and I'll be your host today from SUNY ESF. I just want to do a quick reminder that all webinars in this series are archived at www.esf.edu slash openacademy slash webinar, and you'll also get a follow-up email after the webinar reminding you what that address is, so you don't need to jot it down. <laughs> um, SUNY ESF offers uh, graduate certificates in radiation curing chemistry. Uh, these include courses in intro to polymer coatings as well as radiation curing of polymer, polymer technologies. Uh, you can find out more information on our web at esf.edu slash openacademy slash online slash rcc. I'd like to remind everybody that the big ideas for UV and EB technology is just about a month away. Uh, you can come join us out at Redondo Beach in California, March 19th and 20th. For more information and registration, visit thebigideasconference.com or the RadTech website, which is radtech.org. So today, uh, I'm excited to, we're going to be bringing you a webinar on the 3D printing of the very small, which is being presented by Andrea Bubendorfer, one of this year's Rad Launch class. You can meet and talk with Andrea and the four other 2019 Rad Launch class in person at the Big Ideas Conference, uh, so I hope you'll consider coming. Andrea leads the microfabrication team at Callahan Innovation, a government agency in New Zealand to accelerate innovation. She has background in microfluidics, surface chemistry, and photolithography. Her main current interest is in the making, micro, uh, making micro, microfabrication an, an accessible technology. And this has been the inspiration for the MicroMaker, a new 3D printer for rapid prototyping at the, at the micro scale. So I'd like to thank you and welcome Andrea. All right, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Brandon. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I'd like to thank Red Tech for this opportunity to speak and also acknowledge the support from Callahan Innovation. And also to thank all of you who are joining me today. So um, please feel free. Check out our website um, and feel free to contact me with the email address. I'll also have my personal email address up at uh, my work email address up at the end of the, the presentation as well. Right, so I'm going to talk to you today about MicroMaker, our new 3D printer for cost effective rapid prototyping on the micro scale. With this technology, we can easily print structures that are smaller than a hair, and you can see the example shown here against the paper clip what sort of things I'm talking about rapid prototyping. So, but first a little bit more about us. As Brandon mentioned, I'm from New Zealand. Um, for those who don't know, it's a small geographically isolated country in the Southern Hemisphere. We have a population less than 5 million in an area that's slightly larger than the UK. It's currently 8 o'clock here or just after on a, a Saturday morning on a summer day with an unexpected high probably around 25 degrees, maybe um, I think 77 Fahrenheit. So you can see the closest country to us is Australia, and otherwise we're pretty much in the middle of a giant ocean. Right. So I'm a principal scientist and leader of the microfabrication team, as um, Brandon mentioned, at Callahan Innovation. It's our government agency to support innovation in New Zealand. We get our name from Sir Paul Callahan Hilland from 1947 to 2012, and our organisation was formed uh, a couple of years after that. He was New Zealander of the Year in 2011 for his vision to champion science and business for New Zealand's economic growth. So I sit in the Research and Technical Services Division, which is made up of about 200 scientists and engineers in four groups, Advanced Materials, Advanced Manufacturing, Biotech, and Tata and IoT, which is where my microfab team sits. So we keep talking about microfabrication. For those of you not familiar, it's the processes and techniques for making miniature structures around the micron order. So that can span from nanometers to millimeters, at least in one dimension. 
These microfabricated components are ubiquitous in high-tech devices and enable all this miniaturization that you see here. I'll discuss specific applications towards the end of the talk. For the New Zealand context, microfabrication is an excellent export industry with high value and a small fat form factor and a global market. And you can see the advantage with um, our position, how good for New Zealand it is to export these high value things that are actually easy to export. So being motivated, the fact that it is such a valuable industry, we also have to recognise that microfab processes are time consuming and expensive. Even developing the simplest of structures can take a really long time. So here's an example of a glimpse of what it looks work like in a microfabrication clean room. Um, you can see that there's, there's strict protocols for suiting up and going in, um, even to do the most simple of operation. But everything is, is very manual, time consuming and very expensive. So after some years of working in this environment, I became interested in making microfabrication a much more practical and accessible tool. The problem that I really wanted to solve was to find a very fast and affordable way to make tiny structures that could just reduce the amount of effort that was involved with it. So with this motivation, we set to break down these barriers, accelerating microfabrication, and the result is Micromaker, a Callaghan innovation project that's supported also by Kiwi Innovation Network, or KiwiNet, as a commercialisation partner to the project. Micromaker is a convergence of 3D printing and microfabrication for rapid prototyping on the micro scale, open a whole new high value area of additive manufacturing. Myself and co inventor Andrew Best, shown here with some test prints, want to use this technology to disrupt rapid prototyping of the very small. And so for the next section, I will explain how this works. I'll make the distinction now. I've used the name Micromaker. That's the name of the 3D printer that we've made. It uses the new patent pending 3D printing technique that's behind the printer. And we call this type of 3D printing laminated resin printing, or LIP. So firstly, to bridge the gap between 3D printing and microfabrication, I'd like you to note the close relationship between photopolymers, these are polymers that change their properties with light, and photoresists that are light sensitive materials for precision patterning with UV. A particular set of photoresists, that is negative photoresists, become insoluble after patterning. By exposure to UV, a catalyst is liberated which, after heating, cross-links the photoresist to form a polymer. So, in many ways, there's a lot of overlap between photopolymers and photoresists. Now, the photoresists were designed for the electronic industry and underpin semiconductor print processing, and this explains their ability to create very small and very high-resolution structures as needed in um, microfabrication. The modern thick film resist and by that I mean film are typically photoresists, which are on the order of 10 to 500 microns or thereabouts, have gained a lot of popularity over the last couple of decades for microfluidics or lab on a chip devices, which I'll talk a little bit about more later. MEMS, which are microelectromechanical systems, also known as micro machines. Those include micro sensors such as the accelerometers seen in drones and four pendants, pixel walls for displays, and many more. With these types of devices, we've gone from essentially 2D structures to six structures, usually only a few layers, often referred to as 2.5D, but nevertheless, absolutely out of the plane. So I've given this diagram to just give a little bit more feel for the dimensions of where these structures fit in and um, how UV can make that, allow that high level of resolution that you don't get from 3D printing due to the photoactivity in the photoresist and in the patterning mechanisms for them. So fabricating MEMS with photoresists has become increasingly popular as an alternative to micro-machining in silicon. And these modern material photoresists have become industry standards now. They were developed at IBM for high aspect ratio structures and are chemically amplified photoresists obtain, obtain extreme resolution as well as structures. In this next section, I'll describe how we use these photoresists to obtain 5 micron voxel resolution in a 3D printing environment. OK, 
Okay, so in our 3D printing technique, laminated res resin printing, we provide microscale rapid prototyping through the use of firstly the high resolution dry film photoresist I mentioned obtained, and these are obtained with precision spot die coating and thicknesses down to five microns. And because they are produced in these sophisticated slot die coating machines, the tolerances are extremely high um, with a reproducibility of um, plus or minus 125 nanometers, or if you'd like to keep in the same units, that's 0.125 of a micron. And it shows just that precision that you can get with the layer thickness that defines our Z resolution. We also use fast UV pro projection um, with five micron pixel size at the print bed, and that defines the resolution in X and Y. Laser patterning can also offer further customization, including um, potentially higher resolution with that. And on top of that, we can laminate many layers of dry film to build up true 3D structures. So next I will step through the operations in more detail. Okay. In addition to the resolution that the photoresists provide, the protective cover sheets that they come supplied in also offers protection against dust and dirt that clean rooms have to work extremely hard to exclude. And as proven from their demonstrated market use with MEMS, they have excellent material characteristics. So next I will play a short video and that will show an example pattern sequence of small Fresnel lens that's projected onto a photoresist film. So just a few rings there, but just you can see each of these images that go past. I just it again. Um, whoops, ah, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, okay. Right, diagrammatically, we're going to look at the operations, the order of operations in machine processing. So I'm going to show for the nth layer with n minus 1 previous layers on the print bed. Grab the pointer here. So we've got a print bed here with n minus 1 layers that have already been activated on a print stack on the print bed. Um, a projector up here with each of the patterns being exposed as shown in the video here. Photo resist, sorry, um, print bed here, photo projector here with um, the pattern onto the photo resist. Photo resist coming off a supply roller and a shutter across. So the shutter is in position as the projector exposes the pattern to prevent any patterning through into previous layers. And from that we get the slice or 2D layer for that pattern exposed to the film here. In the next step, what we have here is the projector is now finished, so there's no projection pattern from here. The shutter has moved back from this position out of the way. The Z stage comes up and the lamination roller has moved across from this position to laminate the stack, the next activated photoresist onto the stack. So we're ready for the next layer. Right, and here we go. We are now ready to deposit the next layer layer N plus 1 in the same way with the shutter back in this position, the projector exposing again and we've now got the N layers on the stack here and you'll note that the um, as the film is transported along the protective cover sheets unwanted are removed to take up rollers. Okay. Right. So the machine itself is a desktop style printer with dimensions about 60 by 60 by 30 centimetres and um, a weight of 20 kilograms. And um, I'll just apologise for um, not using Imperial units as well. I tend to work in SI. Growing up in New Zealand, it's, it's um, all we use really. Um, the machine is designed essentially as a mini clean room. So you recall back earlier on the, the protocols of using the clean room where Humans have to suit up and we have the HEPA filters to exclude the dust, dirt and contamination. Essentially the box now acts as the mini clean room, dirt and UV contamination free. Just a, um, an easy way of keeping the grubby humans that create a lot of this dirt on the outside. And because of the UV um, contamination requirements as well, 
we have this enclosed from UV with a red window that allows us to safely observe the inside. In terms of specifications of the machines, um, I'll note that the machine is able to allow significant customization. Um, these are a table of the specifications that we're working to at the moment with um, a lot that's quite capable to change from this base. I note that we've used epoxy photoresists, but also recognise that other UV activated dry materials work. Um, we've used projection as one source of UV activation, but I also mentioned the use of lasers as well. Um, one really good feature with this is that the dry film provides enormous scalability. So although we're printing tiny structures with um, really small layer thickness and um, small structures that can be printed, the actual photoresists themselves are obtained in um, rolls of with widths up to 250 millimetres and lengths of up to 100 metres, which basically means that we can go from rapid prototyping to production in the industry standard material with desirable material characteristics. And that's an enormous advantage as often with material, um, with, with rapid prototyping, materials that are used that have the characteristics suitable for rapid prototyping, which aren't necessarily those of the final environment. So being able to keep those as the cradle to grave process means that you don't have to then go back and work out the changes process as you go. So note also the um, material characteristics if you're interested in, in microsensor type of devices. The, um, the storage modulus in particular is, is um, close to a measure of elasticity and with this being a photoresist or um, photo, effectively a photopolymer, the material is flexible enough that it can create um, membrane type of structures and flexible deflectible type of structures as used in micro sensors um, and it has the elasticity to move. So we don't just print passive structures but active structures as well. Note also the operating temperature range minus 60 to 200 um, degrees Celsius is wide and because these materials are based on photo, photo resist rather than photopolymers they have that extra resistance to um, not just temperature but solvents, acids and bases, which means that they are able to operate in almost every environment. Okay, so in this slide I've shown a few examples of structures that we've printed with a wide variety of applications. And the scale bars are probably pretty hard to see on them, but um, the Fresnel lens shown near the top is a 90 layer structure and um, it is Scale bar here is similar across, so it gives an idea of the sort of we can print. Um, when we talk about our resolution of five microns, um, this is actually really a true resolution because this is an inherent um, the voxel that we're printing in, rather than um, an approximation as to what the machine can do. Um, note also that we have interest in depositing metals as part of the process and we're really interested in developing um, how far we can take that conductive tracks as well. So to put in context of how laminated resin printing compares with other types of 3D printing, I've, I've put up a table from the ASTM, ASTM uh, family of 3D printing classes. ASTM recognises seven families of additive manufacturing as well as a hybrid. So where do we fit with that? The most closely related types of 3D printing are laminated object manufacturing and bat polymerisation. Like laminated object manufacturing, laminated resin printing builds up multi layer structures by laminating stacks of layers together. In contrast, however, in laminated resin printing, the patterns are not cut and there is no adhesive to bond the layers. In laminated uh, resin printing, the photo is often the surface bond together during that lamination step shown earlier and then are fully polymerized in all planes during a heat cure stage. Built in a single material, there's no interfacial stress or delamination between layers as you can get when you've got a, um, a mix of polymers plus adhesives. Now comparing to VAT polymerization, laminated resin printing also uses UV to selectively expose a photosensitive resin. 
However, in contrast, LRP, laminated resin printing, has no VAT, and there is no mechanism needed to deposit liquid resin layers. These layers are preformed in microfabrication quality dry film photoresist, as I mentioned earlier, with that extreme tolerance. And the use of these dry films also means that there's no shrinkage or distortion, and the consist consistency from print to print is excellent as a result from that. So compared to photopolymers, these photoresist films can be patterned to this exceptional resolution. Um, the actual achievable resolution of these photopolymers can be even higher than what we're doing with um, two microns achieved in X and Y, and they can also come down to a what be used in a wide variety of thicknesses, down to that five microns or possibly even less. Um, right, so our niche is in small and or high resolution structures. We can print structures by themselves or we can print them on substrates such as fabric, paper, silicon or PCBs. So we can start to combine things like microfluidic moulds with electronic circuits or print onto perhaps a temporary tattoo type of material um, for a wearable. And that's using the material with the demonstrated extreme performance with the ability for active structure. So um, all of these things combine to give more than the um, benefits that you typically get of 3D printing, but have the combination of the rapid prototyping for 3D printing as well as some of the advantages that you get with um, microfabrication. In particular, overhangs are especially easy to create with this technique, as when we're putting down these multiple layers within um, pattern structure built in the uncross-linked material, it's um, very easy to produce structures such as overhangs and um, membranes that we can move out from the material underneath, which is otherwise fairly difficult to have without a support material. And we note that the supporting material of the uncross-linked photoresist is highly soluble compared to um, typical pre-polymers and is very easy to wash away. So these advantages offer many applications, especially where size and weight matter, as noted earlier with the miniaturization trend. But in particular, I'll just draw attention to the fact that these smaller devices have a lot of different drivers. Um, they're smaller, lighter, faster. Um, it means that they can be minimally invasive, say for a wearable, but also if you think of things like the hardware of the Internet of Things, they can be put in very in accessible locations, and if they're small enough that they could be, say, self-powered by uh, energy harvesters, then um, they can be put in um, maybe even permanent structures, for example, if you want to measure strain in a bridge. Uh, having a battery sealed in is just something that's not really realistic. Um, consuming less resources is also a really interesting point as well because we look at something like your cell phone and you think well this it doesn't weigh very much maybe 150 grams but the amount of mining that actually goes to extract these materials is um, actually orders of magnitude more than that so the ability to use only what you need that you get from additive manufacturing is also an enormous advantage with that so I'll discuss some of these applications now as we move towards the um, end of the presentation. So in no particular order, um, Brandon mentioned that I come from a microfluidics background, which is where I picked up my interest in microfabrication to enable this. Um, for those of you not familiar, microfluidics is the technology that underpins lab on a chip devices, which are increasingly used for point of care diagnostics. They require very small samples, which um, is very often useful, for example, if you're the um, premature baby that's having to take um, blood every hour, um, it has a fast turnaround. It's almost near real time with the credit card on a chip type of size devices. So if you were having a, um, an operation where a surgeon wanted to make a critical decision as to what they do next, rather than sending something up to a lab, which even if they fast track it, could take hours, this near real time testing can have really literally turnarounds in minutes. Um, it's so valuable for care testing, say for example, if you to know a very rural areas, third world countries, agriculture type of environments. Um, and because you are using such low sample sizes, then there's also a lower 
corresponding amount of wastage as well. And the whole reason that this microfluidics works is that we need this small scale to enable laminar flow. When surface area dominates over volume, we get into a low Reynolds number re regime and flow behaviour changes from turbulent to predictable, which allows these predictable microfluidic movements. Um, but to get to actually having good microfluidic devices, you normally need to have dimensions in a microfluidic channel that are well under a millimetre for effective measurement. So you can see with the scale that we're printing, millimetre is, is fairly generous. Okay, as a next example, we've talked a little bit about um, miniaturisation for microsensors before. Um, I'm very interested in making microsensors available, accessible for a wide variety of environments as well as lowering the power requirements. Um, especially with this emerging Internet of Things devices and the interest in, in wearable technology. Now, 3D printing of microsensors in general is becoming um, highly valuable, and even using typical 3D printing techniques, people are very motivated to develop microsensors just because of the pr rapid prototyping that you can get and the fast turnaround to um, understand and work out how these devices work. And especially the smaller that they get, the properties that they have are not necessarily completely predictable compared to how you'd expect on the larger scale. So the, the four main types of basic MEM springs, which are things that um, can deflect in a measurable way in response to an environmental stimulus, are these um, basic structures here that we have a cantilever that can move up and down, the plate that's pretty similar but across a, a broader area, a bridge that is essentially a connected plate, and a membrane that's an enclosed plate that must have a fine enough structure that it can have a deflection in between that. So for example, if you were looking at a pressure sensor, you might want to be able to look at what the pressure is above this membrane, which would make this membrane bow and see how much distortion that there is into that cavity. And if you take the example of the, um, the simpler cantilever sensor, then there's also a huge direction that you can go in further with these sensors in terms of functionalising them to recognise space-specific um, molecules, working out the amount of stress or heat difference by the amount of bending, um, vibration as a balance or um, change in heat to look at um, many different ways that these cantilevers can respond and measure different environmental properties um, in practice. Right. Aerospace in particular is one that I'm really fascinated about. Um, in aerospace, we recognise, of course, that miniaturisation is critical. Um, I'm particularly excited about this for New Zealand that has um, Rocket Lab as a, um, a New Zealand US company um, that is really revolutionising the way that we're putting satellites into space. Uh, CubeSats containing microsensors are now routinely launched. Um, rather than having years turn around, they're recycling rockets and being able to put up um, CubeSats. I think the intention is perhaps um, at some stage to be able to do this on a weekly type of a basis. On the International Space Station, where astronauts are living for sometimes extended periods of time and it's not clear how their health changes with that environment, there's a lot of custom development and monitoring of astronaut health to really be able to work out um, the effect of that environment on them. Now, in order to actually be able to carry out these types of tests, at the moment, there's the cost of holding large stocks on the space station, or even just the cost of getting um, payload into Earth orbit. It's really expensive. Every single reduction in weight that you can have makes an enormous advantage. And the ability to prototype or have um, miniaturised devices reduce the barrier in both of those applications. Micro robotics is also another example of a very high value technology that's driven by miniaturisation with significant benefits in cost and accessibility into constrained environments, such as, for example, search and rescue operations where, um, for example, if a building had collapsed in an earthquake and we could send a tiny robot in, then they could start to look for things like signatures of life 
for example, carbon dioxide emission that says that there's somebody in there breathing and can even map out the environment in that situation so that rather than having to have people push through to try and get there, they can actually map out a path, find someone to rescue. But of all of these um, examples of application, the most important of all is um, what would you make? Um, I'm very interested to hear ideas of how this could change the work that you're, the areas that you're working in. Come up with ideas that um, we haven't even thought of, things that we don't know about. So um, thank you for listening to this presentation. Um, I've enjoyed giving it and I've hoped that you found it interesting. Um, please feel free to contact myself or Andrew. Um, we'd look forward to hearing from you and finding out more about those ideas that you have. So um, thank you again and this brings to the end of the presentation. Um, I believe that Brandon's going to open up for um, chat questions if anyone has anything that they would like to ask here and now. Um, Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, and if anybody would like to ask Andrea a question, you can type your question into the chat window. And Andrea, if you can just read, read uh, questions as they come in before you answer them. Um, Okay. But I'd like to also like to congratulate you again and on the great work that, that you guys at Callahan Innovation are doing and congratulate you again on the um, being part of the Rad Launch 2019 class. Um, and you're going to be at Redondo Beach at the big show in March if people want to talk yeah. more with uh, you too. That's right. We're looking forward to it and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, so um, the first person has asked the question, other th oh wow, these questions are coming in fast. Uh, other than photoresist, any other material? Um, I think the answer to that would be that yes, any other material um, should work. The constraint that we would have are that ideally the material would have a low solvent content in it. Um, and that helps to keep the high resolution for um, the patterning. Um, and there could be quite interesting functionalized materials as well. Um, I'm interested in particular in functionalized silicone, which are photoactive, and I'm certainly interested to look forward to exploring other opportunities with those. If anyone wants to suggest any specific um, materials that they're interested in. I'd also be happy to try and answer questions about that. Okay, next person um, asks, uh, firstly, thanks for the presentation, that's very kind, and how large is the print area? Um, the print area is, is very customizable. At the moment, using a projector system, we define the print area by the distance of the projector from the print bed. So we make um, trade-offs from the resolution to the print area is needed. Um, we're working for fairly small um, print areas at the moment that would be um, smaller than a microscope slide, probably around um, 15 by 20 millimeters. Um, and that can be extremely customizable, not just for moving the um, projected distance, but also by potential other methods, such as we're using a 180, sorry, 1080 um, K projection, um, 4000 K are more commonly on market, which affords a higher print area with the same resolution or a better resolution for the same area. But there's also options to stitch projection areas together um, and use other systems such as a galvanometer, which is not constrained by that print area. Ah, okay, and the next question, this is a good question. Um, I'm still a little confused how the printer works. Um, I will have to say, giving the um, two minute description for a, um, comp a, a technology that's actually, of course, somewhat more complex than that is um, pr probably a bit unfair to set up with um, the expectation of understanding. No, um, is, is there a wash cycle between each layer to remove the un unreacted photoresist? The answer to that is no, because we use that um, unreacted photoresist as a flat layer that provides support and allows us to laminate these other structures 
the next layers to it. So the typical microfabrication process is, yes, you do remove it after each layer, and that's a point of difference with us, which is partly um, how we're able to form the um, overhangs and so on, but also because it gives um, a much greater smoothness. Um, because we haven't fully cross-linked and cured, um, taken that whole step with each layer, it's also much faster and it also gives better bonding with full cross-linking between those layers as well. So there are multiple advantages, but in the end, um, the end result is that um, no, it just sits there as a support material. Okay, next question. What kind of material is epoxy? So epoxy is a, um, I guess it's a it's an, a class of polymers that are um, noted for their extreme resistance to the environment. So um, epoxy is typically, especially in the setting, don't contain the um, the components that make the difference between a polymer and a plastic. So there's no plasticizers. There's nothing to modify the material um, process with that. It's, it's fairly raw material with um, the catalysts that create the, um, the cross-linking. Um, and because it is this very unreactive type of polymer, firstly, you need to have the UV to stimulate um, the liberation of that catalyst that's within it. It won't react without it. But secondly, that's what provides it that um, thermal and chemical resistance. Um, and it's induced. Um, if I'm not answering any of these questions with um, as well as you'd like, or um, I've missed some of the context at all, please feel free to add more questions and ask anything um, more specific with that. Um, next question, also very interesting. Can the binder contain particles and fillers? Um, I'm very interested in looking at particles and fillers. Um, from my perspective, um, there's a lot of opportunities with very high value functional materials. Initially, at least, the, um, the types of particles and fillers that I would be looking at are on the nanoscale, because on the nanoscale, um, nanoparticles are not interfering with the um, patterning of light on the micron scale that we're patterning. So, um, it depends on the type of particles and fillers. If they're transparent to UV, you can have them much greater sizes, if um, perhaps up to micron range. If they are opaque to UV, then there will be a certain concentration that you can load them to before you start to reduce your UV transparency. So, for example, you can load with um, silver particles at once you get to around a 7% cut out a, around a 7% loading, you start to cut out some of your UV. So again, I guess it's um, a bit of a trade-off and customization to what you want. Um, I'm also interested in containing particles and fillers for the potential that we can also process after printing. So for example, to remove the binder material and having even smaller structures. The next question, the chemical difference between, what are the chemical differences between SLA resins and photoresist? There's two parts, two parts to this, so I'll read it all in one go. Are photoresist still acrylates but with epoxy mixed in, or are there more differences? Um, I guess reasonably complex question, which I'll try and summarize as briefly as I can. Um, the SLA resins are more like plastics than um, polymers that um, a lot of these resins do contain other materials to aid in their printing. Um, photoresist, there are classes of photoresists that are acrylates, but there are quite a wide variety of different photoresists and almost always they're in a single material with um, nothing mixed in. And the reason for that is so that they have true homogeneous um, transparency to um, UV because if there is a mix like a block copolymer or um, blend, then that um, can be a lot more complicated for how it's patterned. So the photoresist that I'm typically using, the um, negative style are um, epoxy based. 
not blended. Um, and yes, there are other differences as well in terms of um, the catalyst and how they are cross-linked as well. Um, I hope that that answers that. Um, how, next question, how dimensionally dependent or anisotropic are the mechanical properties? Um, lots of really great questions with this, nice to see. Um, this is um, in particular with the type of material that we're doing, because we are cross-linking in um, X, Y and Z, oops, screen saver just came up, um, we have very um, isotropic um, properties because that cross-linking is universal in all directions throughout the material. So because the, um, the layers in the lamination process, um, when you laminate, um, what you do is essentially take the very surface of the photoresist film to the edge at which it starts its glass transition. So um, a mono layer of melt and um, because of the difference of that tiny surface scale compared to the bulk, even for a five micron thick film, what you have is um, the enormous overwhelming bulk of this is um, the same solid with um, once you press with heat and um, pressure with heat together um, in that softened state, the laminated layers are chemically phys physically bound at first and then the catalyst as it goes through to link in the later heat cross stage um, does not distinguish between um, X and Y or the Z so that cross-linking reaction carries out um, equally in all directions through so essentially the answer is not dimension dependent. Um, all right, next question. Um, looks like someone from a microfab background, they've asked, do you also use DLP patterning or physical masks? Um, it's possible to use a physical mask, but it doesn't give um, on the fly patterning. Um, if you were to do something like that, you'd have a process that's much more like a microfabrication process where the structure that you make has the turnaround of making that mask first. So we, we are using the dynamic light projection as one method for the patterning at the moment. Um, it gives the same advantage of the mask as being able to pattern that whole layer in a single time. But if you want to produce something like, say, um, 90 or more layers, then having that number of physical masks makes it just really unfeasible. Next, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Is there a difference in mechanics of the perpendicular versus parallel to the layers and how much? Um, I guess it's actually pretty similar to the early question of dimensional dependency and anisotropy in the um, mechanical um, question. Um, so essentially, no, the, the mechanics um, don't have any observable difference. Um, so last, this last question up at the moment is pretty closely related as well. What about of torsion, flexibility and impact of the native material? Um, in terms of um, being able to rotate and be flexible, yes, the material is quite elastic with the, um, the storage modulus closely related to the modulus of elasticity with the range of typically around 2 to 4 gigapascals. The um, material itself is also somewhat tunable. Um, you can adjust that by the degree of cross that you get from um, optional um, extra post-processing such as an equivalent to a hard bake. Um, the, um, Flexibility and torsion is also not just going to be a function of the material, but as a function of the numbers of layers that you have there as well. So, for example, if you had um, maybe a two-layer structure, or say a two-layer membrane in a frame, that membrane or cantilever um, would be 
very significantly flexible compared to something that they had 50 layers. Just the same as if you had a stack of paper, um, two layers would be very flexible compared to try and move 50 um, together. Um, it, it's a combination of the material properties plus the, um, the physical aspects of the design. In terms of impact, I'm assuming that you've seen um, like a physical impact, like a hardness, hardness test. Um, it's very robust um, and not not easily damaged by um, applied forces. So um, that brings us to the end of the questions that we have here. If anyone else has any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. We'll do one cool. last call for questions, and if we don't see something, wrap up. It was a pretty in-depth Q&A, so I think it looks like we've gotten all the questions. I'd like to thank Andrea uh, very much for presenting and sharing this with us today. I'd also like to congratulate both you, Andrew, and all of Callahan Innovation for the really great work that you're, you're doing here. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And just remember that you can come talk more with Andrea about this at the Big Ideas for UV and EB conference, uh, March 19th and 20th. Um, thank you all, and have a great day. And thanks also again from me, and I look forward to the next um, event.